Hallelujah. Let's give a hand clap unto the Lord one more time. Wow, this is awesome. I like what I feel. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Man, if I wasn't a pastor and I didn't have a church to attend to, I'd be, I'd be coming here as a member to this church right here. You guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. There's no doubt about it. God has blessed you. I give honor to you, Pastor, Pastor Ting Wisnan, his, uh, and his wife. Come on, let's give it to Sister Wisnan. And, uh, and your daughter, where is she? Where is she? Where are you? Are you hiding right there? <laughs> wow, just awesome family. I love them dearly. And, uh, and, you know, I was here a couple years ago, like you said, and uh, I had a great time. You might have forgot about me, but I haven't forgot about you. Yeah, I had a great time. And the connection was there, like you said. And it's good to be back. I brought a couple of men with me. Pastor David Brown, he's my executive pastor. He's the one that holds my bag. <laughs> and powerful preacher. You, you are getting ready for a treat in this church. This guy can preach. He's amazing. Tremendous preacher. He'll be a blessing to you. And, of course, I bring this young man, Kenny. Many of you perhaps know him. He's a young man in our church. He's got a call to the ministry. He's evangelizing somewhat. Sometimes he goes without telling me, so I pull his ears. So he shows up here without asking, if you, did you tell your pastor? Just, just in case. That's part of the mentoring. That's the part of the mentoring. <laughs> But it's good to be with Pastor Mendoza as well from Ecuador. Wow. That's a good, good thing. Well, you know what? I've already been in two services, and I didn't think I had any, any energy left. I preached twice. I did my worship already, but you guys are so contagious. Jeez. Yeah, you all guys are. I didn't think I had any energy. I told him, I said, they're good. You guys are good. <laughs> it's awesome. Really, it's good to be here with you today. I'm going to just kind of, he told me, just talk. He had my voice a little shot twice. I preached. Hey, you know, we Pentecostal preachers. We're not Presbyterians or Baptists, but it's just, you know, they talk with a cathedral boys. No, we're not like that. We just preach our guts out. Just the way we do. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if I can do that again. I already did twice. And, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to do the best that I can just to bring a thought from the Word of God. Are you ready? Uh, and I want to say thank you for investing in Ecuador. Ecuador is my native country. I came to the United States in 1976. Uh, that's 45 years ago. <laughs> Many, many, many years ago. And, uh, you know, but still, you never get disconnected from your native place. And I was born there. And I appreciate the uh, investment that you're doing and more that you're going to do. I heard just the Bible school there in the Amazon uh, region. I'll tell you what, it, it, that is phenomenal. And I, 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 I tip my hat to you. I give honors. All the accolades that I can give you, I give it to you. This is a phenomenal thing that you're doing. It really is. It really is. And, I, of course, uh, you know, uh, the leadership is, is, is obvious. This church has a great man of God as a leader. And I know you're loving. And I know you're respecting. And I, I know you are backing him up and kind of capture his vision. And that's so important. So uh, let's go to the reading of the word in, in um, Jeremiah chapter 32. And perhaps I will say something more about your investment in Ecuador as I preach. I don't know how I'm going to go. I'm just, uh, I'm just going to go. So, uh, and it says, uh, Jeremiah 32, verse 8 and 9. Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, Thank you, sir. Uh, by my field, I pray thee, that is an anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for yourself, for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field 
Ohanamiel, my uncle's son that was in Anathoth, and weighted him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. I'm going to jump to verse 14. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take this evidence, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed, and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they might continue many days. For thus saith the Lord, like as I have brought all this great evil upon these people, so will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. In verse 43, jumping all the way down, it says, And fields shall be bought in this land, whereof ye say it is desolated without man or beast. It is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. I'm going to stop the reading right there. I know it's kind of... Uh, just kind of was uh, very, you know, just read a few verses there from this chapter. When you get home, you read the whole thing. But right now, we're just trying to take advantage of the time. And uh, uh, and I'm just going to preach. Uh, the, my subject this afternoon is the greatest investment. The greatest investment. And I believe this church has captured the importance of putting your resources uh, not in something temporal, but something that brings eternal results. And that is so important. That's a key. And I really, uh, my heart is with you, with your pastor, my prayers and all. Let's just pray before I preach. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this. Your presence is here, God. Because you inhabit the presence of your people. And we have praised you and lift up your name. You hear wonder for atmosphere, people have gathered here, oh God, with a purpose. The main purpose is to give you honor and praise. And then you're going to do the rest. Touch us all, oh God. Let, let us receive your word. And they will bring 60, 80, 100 fall. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And God's people shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Uh, the greatest investors, the most successful ones, are those that had the ability to see what others were unable to see or are unable to see. Uh, I call it, they have a canine olfact for business. They smell it. They smell success. They have the ability to see what's underneath the surface. Where some might see dry land, they see veins of silver. They have the ability to see not only the present value of the investment, but the future value of it. And while others are skeptical, and while others doubt the potential, potential of the investment, they are sold out. They believe wholeheartedly in the value of it. The value of the investment. We got all these coins to this, Bitcoin coins and all those investments. People are alert. You know, that's as, as the thing of the day right now. But the point is this. They are willing to sacrifice everything they have with a solid purpose of getting what they believe is worth having. People like uh, Spencer Penrose. Maybe you have never heard that name, but it's in history right there. Spencer Primrose from Philadelphia in the 19th century, well, um, who was born into a very su successful political family. His father got upset when, with, with him when he chose to move to Colorado, Colorado Springs, to pursue the mining field business instead of going to Harvard University to continue the family tradition of law and politics. Uh, his biography tells us something, that while he was in Colorado, he had the opportunity to invest $1,500 in the mining business. And now having that kind of money, he, he wrote a telegram to his older brother requesting him, please lend me, let me borrow $1,500. His brother replied to him, okay, I, 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 this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you $150 for you to purchase the ticket to return home. Spencer, uh, instead of buying the ticket back to Philadelphia, 
He took those $150 and invested in the mining business. Five years later, he went back home. And the first thing he did was to pay his brother he, the $150 that he let him borrow just five years before. But his brother was surprised because he not only got the $150 back, but he gave, he gave him uh, a, a large amount in gold coins. You know, he had, he had produced even more. I'm talking about the 19th century. He gave him an additional $75,000. That's a lot of money back then, gold coins. And as he gave him the money, he said to him this. How you had let me, have not let me borrow, how you had let me borrow those $1,500, I would have given you today $250,000 in gold coins. But since you only sent me one fifty, I'm giving you seventy five thousand in gold coins. And brothers, the rest is history. Spencer Penrose not only became the most successful investor in the metal industry back in those days, but the, but he was the one that opened up the way for the development of the economy in the Midwest. But what? But that that but that happened only. Because he saw what others were not able to see. And he invested all that he had. Because he believed in that. And I believe this church believes investing in something that's much, much greater than mining business of bitcoins. Let me tell you, you are making the greatest investment in the face of this earth. You're investing in souls. You're investing in the kingdom of God. Every dollar that you put in the offering, every dollar that you give for missions, you are investing in the kingdom of God. And brothers and sisters, the recompense and the reward is much greater. Somebody shout hallelujah. Amen. We all live right here. We live near to the, what we call the Silicon Valley, the world center of technology. All the major uh, computer companies are right there. Larry Allison, much, I know you heard that name. Larry Allison, you, uh, I read about him just recently. His biological mother, biological mother gave him for adoption at the age of nine months. And he never met her, fa her mother face to face until he was 48 years of age. So in spite of growing up in a home where he was not loved by his adopted father, he was abused verbally and even emotionally. Uh, psychological, he really was messed up growing up. But Larry never gave up on the dream that he had. His passion was computer design. He moved from Chicago to San Francisco, the Bay Area, when, when he was 22 years of age. He landed a job with Ampex Corporation. And while working there, he developed a database which he named it Oracle. Few years later, he went to his savings account and took all he had. He had $1,200. That's all he had. And then he called two of his friends insulting the idea. Hey, if you guys go in with this, you guys going to be all right. And his bro, one of his friends says, I got $400. The other one says, well, I'll give you another $400. Between all of them, they invested $2,000 in, in which they invested in what is called today Oracle Systems Corporation, a company that's worth $60 billion. I said all that just to say this. All of these people that have found some success investing. In fact, I heard Brother uh, Pastor Mendoza say, investors, ¿cómo, cómo dijo usted? Inversiones, ¿cómo? En del reino, inversionistas. Inversionistas en el reino de Dios. And he was talking here about, you have become uh, investors in the kingdom of God. He was just mentioned that. And, 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 you know, uh, I said all that for that reason. Uh, all of these investors have one thing in common. They have the ability to see things that others don't see. <laughs> and, and, but once, once they see it, 
they are willing to sacrifice it at all. I just pray that you see today. They show you some pictures up here. Nobody saw what we are seeing right now. Thank God to you, Pastor. He saw it when he went to Ecuador. He went to the land that was open. There was nothing there. And he saw churches planted there. And he saw a Bible school being erected there. That's the vision of a true investor. They see things that nobody sees it. And I hope you catch the vision today. I hope you catch the vision. There's no, there's no Bible school radar right, right now. There's nothing. There's only land. There's only jungle. But he saw it. How many here are seeing it right now? You got to see it. And your mind and your heart and your vision. You got to see it. That's the key element of a great investor. They see it. Nobody sees it, but they see it. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. They see beyond the surface. They are passionate about it. They are great visionaries. I see all those elements right here. Right here sitting on the front. Here's your pastor. He is passionate about it. I mean, I just saw him here dancing and jumping. He's passionate about it. He is a visionary. So... I just pray that you see what he's seeing. And you know, this afternoon we are praising and worshiping the greatest investor of all times. You know who that is? Our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. He is the greatest investor of all the ages. The Lord Jesus Christ. He not only invested in 12 men called his disciples, but Matthew 13 and 44 says that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he, he hid it again. And then he, in his joy went and saw all he had and bought the field. Yeah. Hallelujah. The field represents the world. And the field, the world... The Lord saw a church. Jesus saw a church. He saw a treasure called the church. And he went and saw all that he had. Pretty much the Lord bankrupt heaven to buy the field so he can get the treasure that was hidden in the field. For God so loved the world. Let me tell you something. Our God loves people. And out of the sea, the sea of people, billions of people, he was going to get his treasure. He was going to get his church. You and I, we are part of the treasure. And you ought to be thankful that he was willing to invest himself. He gave himself in the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood. He paid it all. He invested in me and you. Nobody saw nothing good in us. Nobody. But he did. Even friends told us you are loser. You're not good for nothing. You will never amount to anything. But the Lord saw a treasure. He saw you. It's one of his children. He saw you filled with his spirit. He saw you baptized in Jesus' name. He, the Lord saw us before, before you were here. The greatest investor. And I'm seeing it right now. Locally here, this church is putting a foundation. This is going to blow up. You better be ready. This is going to blow up. This church is going to just blow up. It's going to be a growth. It's going to be a revival. It's going to be a move of the Holy Ghost like you had never seen before. I hope you believe what I'm saying right now. I'm prophesying in the name of Jesus. It's going to be a great move of the Holy Ghost in this church like you had never seen before. Back of Bill is going to know that there is an Pentecostal apostolic church that believes the word. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You heard that? Now that word righteousness in this text and also in Acts 24 and 4, saying word righteousness, is translated from the Greek word decal, where we get that word equity. The word equity is used frequently in real estate in relation of the value of a property. You have a equity in your home. In other words, you have some money free there. You can do whatever you want to do. I hope you invested in the kingdom of God. It's just a putting a PS right there. <laughs> in other words, you know, God, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him, we become the equity of God. What am I saying is this. The church is the net value of the investment of God in this world. We are the equity of God here on earth. The church. He, he, he did not, he did not call the church into existence like he did with the rest of his creation. He spoke in the sun came there. Moon and the stars came to existence. But to his church, Apostle Peter says that he purchased it. He bought it. He invested. He says he did not do it with silver and gold, but he did it with his precious blood. Come on, church. The Lord has his blood invested in his church. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody really shout hallelujah one more time. Hallelujah. I tell you what. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest investor. Nobody like him. He saw something that nobody was able to see. He bought the field. Somebody say he bought the field. Your pastor went with me to Ecuador, and he bought the field. And he says, I got a lot of investors there. And I know they have vision. And I know they feel what I feel. And now he's going to Bolivia. And we're, going to, we're doing some investments there too. And we're going to be doing some other investments around the world. We're impacting the world. Not with words, but with actions. It's, talk is cheap. But when you put action behind it and you put words behind it, it changes everything. And that's one thing I like about this church and you pastor. You know, I, I, you know me. I don't need to tell you who I am. I may be nobody for you, but I'm somebody. And I've been around the world a couple times, as you know. <laughs> but I tell you, I, I, I'm not seeing too many pastors and leaders like you, Pastor. Are you, you, I'm telling you that seriously. And I'm connected with some big shots, that we call it. But I tell you what, this church, they're not only talking. They put their money in their mouth. And that's valuable. I'm telling you here, let's invest in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. The Lord invested. The Lord Jesus, he invested. Maybe others could not see the value, but the investors of investors, the Lord Jesus Christ, he, had the, he saw the potential that, that, that no one else could see it. And what people saw, unlearned fishermen, these onyx tax collectors, he's, the Lord saw disciples. He saw apostles. He saw evangelists. He saw preachers. He saw Sunday school teachers. He saw saints that were going to turn the world upside down. He saw people full of, God, full of the Holy Ghost and fire. 
ready to go out and give it all for Jesus. I feel that here this afternoon. This church is ready to go out and give it all for Jesus. The Lord saw you and the Lord saw me. He saw people from all kinds of backgrounds, from all cultures, from all languages, with all kinds of problems, lost and sin, and he practically ran rock heaven. He, he risked it all. He saw everything he had. He came into this world in the form of a man. And for three and a half years, he walked among people, healing the sick, giving hope to the hopeless, delivering those that were oppressed. And then he died in the cross. And with his own blood, he purchased our salvation. He took a chance with you. He took a chance with me, so to speak. Oh, and I'm thankful this afternoon. He gave it all. He invested it all. He saw it. He saw it in us. What nobody else could see. He saw a young man from the country of Ecuador. When I landed, you may be sitting. When I landed in New York City in 1976, I was 17 years of age. Came by myself. I knew a lot of the missionaries that were in Ecuador. My dad is one of the founders, apostolic preacher, the first apostolic preacher in Ecuador. He was, he was baptized by Brother Dross, the senior Dross, the father Dross, in 1956 in the name of Jesus. My dad was a Baptist preacher, a theologian, well-educated man. He, uh, he graduated from the Baptist seminar. And my mom too, both of them. Well, people with knowledge. My dad, greatest speaker. And in 1956, Brother Joss came from Colombia to Ecuador. And he came to the service. And the church was, at that time, about 200 members. And that was a mega church back in those days. A Baptist church. And after the service is over, Brother Joss connected with my dad. He says, hey, I'd I like to, I, I, I want to kind of give you a Bible study. And my dad was kind of. Bible study <laughs> to me he says yeah let's 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 go through the Bible it's anywhere he accepted my dad was like that very open and they got together and brother George showing Acts 2 38 and Jesus name baptism and the whiteness of God and, and my dad was the person that he never refuted if it wasn't the Bible he says he told him you know what let me study let me pray let me look into this I had never seen this before People that wanted to invest, brother Drost, <laughs> an investor of the kingdom, and he got my dad, and I thank God for that, because he left, and my dad went and told my mom and says, you know, I'm going to be gone for a week. I'm going to go pray and I'm going to fast, and if the Lord really shows me something, I never seen this before. He was really troubled in his mind and his spirit about the oneness of God and Jesus' name, baptism, something he's never heard before. He was in seminar. He well educated. Maybe he's never seen that before. And he went. And he was away for a week. He came back on Saturday night. And he, he told my mom. He, he hugged her and says, you know what? Something happened to me. He says, what happened? I was reading the book of Acts by myself. And I received what he says. says the spirit got in me and I spoke in tongues. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he spoke. He re my dad received the Holy by himself. Nobody prayed. Somebody that was hungry for the truth. And somebody was willing to invest. His name, Brother Drost. And invested. And my mom, being a Baptist, they, they believe that that's from the devil. She says, oh no, you got the devil in you. And you know, as you know, the tension grew. It was tough because now my dad has the Holy Ghost. Now he has to preach in the Baptist church. <laughs> that would be a little challenged. The days went by and my mom was upset. And then Brother Dross called. He says, hi, what do you think? And my dad says, you know what? I received the Holy Ghost in my life. 
Brother, you can imagine Brother Dross. If you knew, if you don't know him, you didn't know him. I mean, he was a unique man. I thought the father, not the children, the sons. Now the grandsons are preaching. Mark and all of them, the grandsons. I talk about the father. He was a unique individual. My Lord, like apostle, just going everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And he was, he got excited. He says, and now my dad says, now you talked about being baptized in Jesus' name. And then Brother Joe says, do you, uh, do you want it? And my dad say, I want to be baptized in Jesus' name. Yeah. I wasn't planning to tell you the testimony, but I'm telling you now. So he sent two preachers from Colombia that came down. Brother, Brother Contecha was one. And the other name I don't remember, but I don't remember, I remember him because he was, he was a fireball. And I, you don't remember the names of fireball people. That's why I don't forget to pastor's name, even though, even though it's hard to say the last name. I, I, I kind of say the pretty good thing, whistling. Hey, I'm getting it. You know, I don't speak German anything, but that's pretty close. That's pretty close. And you know, and, and uh, so this brother came on a weekday, and they took my dad and baptized him in the river. The name of the river is called Salado. Maybe someday you're going to go to that river. It's in the coast. And they baptized my dad. And I, we all watching. We were kids. And watching. And he got baptized in Jesus' name. Came out. Went and told my mom. Because my mom says, I ain't going there. She was mad. And when women get mad, you better watch it. <laughs> my mom was mad. I can't believe you. We got everything here. We had a nice home. We had everything. Salary, Baptist. That's one thing about it. Take care of the people. I just, I just gonna be honest. We had everything. House, salary. We were doing good. My dad was graduated from from seminar. Great student. Great. I mean, we were doing great. And now he's baptized in Jesus' name. And now he, the, the brothers are asking, now what are you gonna do? Are you gonna keep being part of the congregation there, the Baptist movement? And my dad says, well, what should I do? He says, why well, you have to make a decision? And he says, well, okay, uh, let me talk to my wife again. <laughs> By that time, my mom's already called the Baptist missionary. So when he, he got there, they were already waiting for him. And he says, uh, you know, your wife just told us what happened. So I'm sorry, you either you turn back from the devil's doctrine or you have to resign the church. You have to evacuate the house. I don't know where you're going, but you have to leave. And my mom is there. And, and, and my dad is there. And he says, okay, well, I'll tell you what. Let me, um, give me this week and just let me preach the last service as a pastor of this church. Let me preach Sunday. And they agree. He says, that's the last thing we're going to do. So I'll tell you, that, that, this is historical because on Sunday, the place is packed. I remember like it was yesterday. I was just a little boy, but I remember. The church was packed, and they called my dad, and he stood up there. He says, let's open our Bibles in Acts 2.38. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Ain't my dad preach Acts 2.38? is the last message as a pastor of the first Bethel Church of Guayaquil, Ecuador. And at the end, nobody had heard that before. He asked, he said, I've already been baptized in the name of Jesus. I'd like to know how many more would like to go with me and be baptized in Jesus' name. The church had about 200 members. At least 80 went out that moment. My dad said, follow me. And they walked to the river and they were baptized in the precious name of Jesus. And that's how everything is started in the country of Ecuador. My dad was pastoring the first back Bethel church in Guayaquil, Ecuador. And we are now, he called the church the first Pentecostal church of Ecuador. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, we are the first church. This is the first church. We're not the last, we're the first. You ought to 
rejoice. We are the first church. I'll tell you why. I think I, I got so much to say, but I'm going to forget about that. I have a lot. But I'm feeling like it going off right now. <laughs> because, you know, my dad preached. We hear about that's about 80 people. But no, we, he's out. He's out. So no, that's Sunday. Monday, he tells us, okay, we got to move out. And we are pulling our stuff out, our clothing, and all of these things. It's my dad, my mother. At that time, we were five children. We Seven, no, but it was only five. The two is still had not arrived yet. <laughs> It were five of us, it, 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 you know, and, and so it, it, my mom is crying. My mom is mad. She just did not accept the, 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 the Acts 2, 38 message. Of and she was against it. She's crying. She's, she's crying because she's mad. And, and then the kids, and anyway, and, and she says, where are you going to take us? And Pastor Mendoza is here. Why Aquila is a, is a city that's in the coast, in Pacific Coast, just like here. And back in those days, they had those homes like they still have it in, like in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, Philippines, in those countries. They got they got a river or ocean, and they built the houses, you know, with those long poles over. Still, yeah, they put. It says, "I find a room. We all gonna go there." So we going in there. We kids, we happy everywhere. <laughs> My mom was not happy, but we were happy because, you know, you, you, the, the, the floor had these woods and it had a little space between, and so you can see through it. And we're just having fun seeing the fish and this. And <laughs> <laughs> having fun, throwing things through there. I mean, just uh, <laughs> through the cracks of that wood to the water. We're just seeing all that. So we, we, we were okay, but all of a sudden, there was nothing, no food. I mean, the, the, which my dad just started the church, so he called all these people that he 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 baptized. They went and rented this place. My Lord, wow! It was it was it was terrible. It was just it was just walls, no no roof, and the place is hot. It's in the coast, but there's my dad preaching. He's got some ah, people getting the Holy Ghost, people getting baptized, and not in short time. My dad had a revival. Over 200 people already, just in short, and God began to bless. Because somebody invested. You know, I, I want to close what I wanted. I'm, I'm off my message, so forgive me. I preached two times already. I'm just giving me my testimony. This is a, a young, I came when I was 17. I'm, I'm going to be 63 next month. You, you, I mean, it's been many years since this. But there we are, kids. And then uh, brother, one of the brothers there um, uh, from Brother Joe's, Brother Joe's came down and says, you know what? This is going great. Uh, wow. What I, what I want you to do now, I want to move you to the capital city called Quito. There's no church there, but it seems like you are a revivalist. And they moved us to a place where there's, there's nobody there. I remember getting off the bus. My dad says, you guys just stay here. I'm going to look for a place to live. We were there all day in the bus station, crying, hungry. You can imagine. A lot of sacrifice. And we were kids. And then my dad came back about four or five and says, I found a place. So they, they got all their stuff, all their luggage, what we had, and get a taxi, and then we go. And got to the place. Until today, the church is still there. Then my dad started until today. <laughs> until today, same property, the little little studio apartment is still there today. And we got there in the little studio. My dad began to teach Bible study. There was no converse, zero come, nobody. You know what's to dig out church from the ground? That's hard. I did it here in Pittsburgh. We had over a thousand attendants this morning. But it's it's not easy. You gotta dig it out. I say you gotta dig it out. And there's my dad working, teaching. We're suffering. We didn't have any money, nothing. We're going hungry. We didn't have no shoes in our feet. That, to that point, they had no shoes in your feet. And all of a sudden, oh, thank 
God for the investors. And thank God for you, Pastor, because he's seeing something in Ecuador. And he's seen something in, 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 uh, in the Philippines. And he's seen something in, 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 over in, in all those Cameroon, all those African countries. That's awesome. Because I don't know if you heard his name. Brother Carl Ballestero. Brother Ballestero. Maybe if you've been around Pentecost, Apostle, you've heard that name. Because now his grandkids are preaching all over. They're pastor in Florida. I was preaching the camp meeting up there in, in, in Florida, and he was there, and I was sharing not this thing, but I, I shared something about Ecuador and what Brother Ballestero did. I didn't know his grandson was there. He came running, crying. He, he said, we didn't know my grandfather had all those things from Ecuador. Ecuador. We're not even knew. And now we know because he came in 1966. I was about that time or eight, nine years old. He came, Brother Ballester, he didn't know a word of Spanish. And he showed up with about four or five men from his church. He used to pastor a church in Indianapolis. I don't know how he heard. I know for Brother Joe Stone, but he showed up. We didn't have anything. Had a little building. The church is there. My dad started to start, that, 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 you know, make it grow, that church. He's evangelizing, teaching Bible study. He's working hard. And Brother Ballester walks in on a Sunday. And five men with him. They bring him boxes, 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 maybe 12, 15, a lot of big boxes. And he brought by the stairs telling them, you just bring it in, bring it in. So they keep bringing. We're standing just like you right now, sitting there watching all these white men. We never seen so many white people in one shot. I'm just being honest. I mean, I, I, I got to the point that I told my brother, I said, they look transparent. I mean, because I had never seen them. So they were blonde, blue eyes. I mean, and we, we were kids. You know when kids, how, how kids are. And my brother, and my brother, you know, he's, yeah, they look transparent. And he looks at me, no, they just why? They just why? Okay. He was older than me. So <laughs> that's just the truth of it. Uh, kids are very innocent. They don't know anything. And they saw the boxes, and then my dad didn't speak English. Then nobody knew Spanish. Brother Ballestero had learned just a few words. And my dad was trying to communicate with him and trying to call somebody that knew something. It was, it was, a, it was a thing that day. I can never forget a boy, nine years old maybe. And then he began to say some words to my dad. But, you know, he comes from the United Pentecostal Church in the United States. Uh, la, la, and then you're visiting. The God put in his heart. He saw an ambition. Go to Ecuador. Help those people. And he landed in the, in the city of Quito, the capital. And he says, I brought some boxes. These boxes are filled with clothing. They are filled with shoes. They have filled with toys. And we would like all the children from Sunday school to get some of these things. And we have some things for the adults. We like to get the kids. Because God put this in my heart. And so they made us line up. I was just a little boy. They made us lined up. And so I, lined, I got on the line. And Brother Ballestero was here. Come here, young man. What is your name? Huh? Jaron? Oh, how old are you? 16? Oh, well, I'll tell you we're nine. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was nine. Uh, but anyway, you're going to have to play me. Can you do that? I'm easy to play. I'm nobody special. Now, you don't know, but don't worry about it. You just do it. All right. You stand. Uh, you me. You stand right there. The hang is me. Uh, what was your name? Jaron. Jaron is me. So this is this is the men from Brother Ballester. There's about five, five people here line up, and they got all kinds of things, and that, this is me. So hold the mic for me like that. So Brother Ballester, when it got my turn, boys, kids are coming and got to me. I'm standing there. We're excited. We have nothing, nothing. Listen, we didn't have nothing. And Brother Ballestero was going and putting, put your hands like that. It says, he gave us a t-shirt to every boy. And then he gave us a pair of jeans and put it like that. And then he gave us a toy and he gave me a roller skate. <laughs> he says, these toys are for you. And then he, he was holding so I'm holding excited. They got nothing. Listen, when you don't have nothing, 
something is big. I was nine years old. I'm 63. Think about that. He didn't know who he was given to. He didn't know who he was investing on. And he says, I want you to hold that. Come here just a close. And, and he laid his hands and prayed for me. And when he prayed for me, thank you, son. Just go sit down. When he prayed for me, I felt something going from the top of my head to the bottom of my head. Nine years old. I began to talk in tongues. That day, God put a call. He didn't know who he was investing. He didn't have a clue. He just fell from God. I got to go to Ecuador. And, I, and, and he prayed pray for me. And I felt something. And when God called me to preach at 21 years of age, I began to travel. And I looked for Brother Ballestero. In 1997, when they asked me to speak in the general conference here in Utah, I looked for Brother Ballestero and I said, Brother Ballestero, that's the little boy that you pray. You invested. Thank you for investing in Ecuador. You didn't know anybody. You didn't know the language. You didn't know the people. You didn't know the culture. But here's one of your investments. Here's a, Now I'm preaching here. The Lord has taken me all over the world preaching the gospel, preaching conference, raising a church, raising here. You never know who you invest in on. You never know. So when you give something for the kingdom of God and missions, you might be investing in other Elias Limones. Somebody that God's going to raise up from nothing. And it's going to put a ministry. And it's going to give him a voice. And it's going to give him an influence. And it's going to travel and preach all over the place and raise churches and, and preach the Acts 38 Mass. You never know who you invest in on. But that's one of the things you got to catch today. What I'm giving is not just giving. I'm investing in the kingdom of God. I'm investing on somebody. And I like everybody to raise up your hands up in the air. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Oh, come on, God. Raise up in this church, investors in the kingdom of God. He ayaba shata koria na la baba baba boy. That's a let the Holy Ghost deal with you right now. Jesus, give me a vision. Jeremiah, buy the field. Nobody's buying anything right now, but buy it. This empty field doesn't have anything but a buy because someday it's going to be worth something. I want everybody here to buy the field right now. Buy the field right now. Come on in the Holy Ghost. Let the Holy Ghost touch you right now. Speak with another tongues right now. Prophesy right now. Open your mouth and prophesy. And say what my pastor is doing. Is investing in the kingdom of God. People that we don't know. Language that we don't speak. We don't know anything. But there might be somebody that God's going to raise up to impact. To impact the world. Come on, church. I know you can do better than that. You can you leave the Holy Ghost to deal with you, with your heart. And whatever you're going to invest, you better do it. What the Holy Ghost is putting in your heart, you better do it. Yeah, 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 kaya bo shanda da da ba. Wow, I feel the Holy Ghost very strongly talking, dealing right now. I feel the Holy Ghost doing our work right now. Let come on, let's give a little freedom.
I know it's crowded, but there's room at this altar. If somebody wants to come invest for just a few moments before we fill out pledge cards, if there's anybody that wants to come to this altar right now and say, I'll, I'll, I'll buy the field. I'll buy the field. I'll sell all. I'll, I'll get a hold of it. I'll buy the treasure in the field. You cut up a hoshandara mahai. Come on, the Holy Ghost is falling all over this place. Right where you are, that's it. If you don't make your way here, if it's too crowded, just lift your hands and your voice right where you are. Let the Holy Ghost fall. For the next few moments, we're going to pray. We're going to give ourselves. We're going to surrender. God is speaking to some of you right now. He's speaking. He's speaking. He cut up a hoshanda. He's speaking a number. He's telling you this much. The Lord's challenging you right now. The Lord is calling you to sacrifice right now.